I beg you to try it, Patricio. Let me get this straight, Carla. You disagree on the weapon, you disagree on the number of blows. <laughs> Listen to me, Patricio. You were there once in your life. Hey, people. Trish Wood here. I believe that our guest today is going to be one of the, maybe the most important interviews we do this year, because it's going to put into context uh, something that's happening and, and very, very likely answer questions that are bothering you. And the, and the questions are about how did trans extremism develop and go from you know zero to a hundred without any time for debate or thoughtful consideration or even the perception of data-driven policy i mean women have been thrown under the bus i've talked about that before our sex is denied our protections reversed our space is infiltrated and and our sports are being destroyed and even motherhood this sacred thing of being a mother is now also being, you know, we're not breast feeders, we're chest feeders. I mean, it's absurd. It's absurd. And, and, but we live in a time of absurdity, don't we? You know, we learned that through COVID-19, um, that, that we live in a time of absurdity and ideology, ideologically driven reality, right? That's sort of where we are right now. Um, and for me, even just sort of sitting back during COVID, I didn't really have time to deep dive this. We had Abigail Schreier on. She wrote a terrific book about how social contagion may be what's driving young women wanting to have sex changes, you know, with breast amputation and the whole nine yards, hormones, everything. Uh, it's awful. If you've ever seen the pictures of the chest of a, a young person who's had their breasts removed, for a, a transition, it's it's an awful thing to see. Um, so the question is, how do we get here? I was busy doing COVID for two years, as you well know, and I still don't feel like I have a handle on that. I'm trying, but I don't have a handle on vaccines yet. That changes every day. But, but I, I felt that we had to address this because it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we cannot just sit sort of quietly by without being fully engaged, because guess what? This is being, you know, driven again by captured academia, uh, capitalism and corporatism, uh, ideologically driven politicians, of course the media. I mean, it's the same people, the same crew that dragged us through COVID-19 with very little reliance on actual science and data and reality, right? I mean, we still have politicians saying, I've had, you know, 88 boosters, but I got COVID. Thank God for the vaccine. I mean, that's actually happening. Our prime minister did that. So this is not unlike that. It's the same captured institutions being fueled by big, big money. But that was the piece I did not understand until I had a conversation about a year ago with our guest coming up. Her name is Jennifer Bielek. And she writes a blog called The 11th Hour, warning about the rise of this phenomenon. I don't agree with her about everything. You know, I, we don't do that on this show. But what, what she, you know, we have people on who we disagree with on some points, but she's done some wonderful work uh, digging up what is driving this, how it got so big so fast, and the story is absolutely fascinating. It's the first explanation I have heard that explains how we got to where we are now. Okay, so her blog is called The 11th Hour. You must go there. The other thing that happened recently, which... Um, which I, I kind of enjoyed was Matt Walsh's doc called What is a Woman? Now, he's a right-wing commentator. I hate the phrase right-wing, conservative commentator. Pretty conservative, but kind of funny in a downtrodden, Eeyore-esque way. You know, he's a very kind of interesting personality. Again, don't always agree with everything Matt Walsh says and does, but he's, he's bold because speaking out the way he does in this film tackling the trans ideology is a very dangerous thing to do right now. 
Uh, but he did it, and the film is getting millions, literally millions of views. P there's an audience for it. Here's how I see this film. It's very much like a conservative view, uh, or, or sorry, it's very much like a conservative version of Michael Moore. Right? You, say, you know, Matt Walsh can maybe be criticized for being a bit glib in it, but hey, you know, Michael Moore was glib about Columbine, Bowling for Columbine, and he was glib about 9-11 in Fahrenheit 9-11. But that, that kind of glibness and humor drives home a very important point in those two films, and obviously what is a woman, too. It starts off, he's asking people what is a woman. Obviously nobody can say what it is, including, remember, the Supreme Court nominee who just got on the court. She couldn't and wouldn't go there. But then it gets into some very interesting moments that... Um, that really expose what's wrong and, and how it's connected actually to another phenomenon that I covered that also helps to explain it. And that is that when the experts on this are pushed with logic and a demand for data or, and an explanation, they cannot give it, right? They, they say, well, I'm not going to continue with this interview or we're going to stop or I'm not going there. It's remarkable, and it's very, very much like an experience I had when I was doing documentaries on uh, satanic ritual abuse, which also captured psychology and psychiatry for a while, for ill. Um, and it makes it feel very much like they're, they're in a kind of a, a cult of academia, right? They, they, they are taught these things and taught to think these things and study these things and say these things, but they can't defend them when someone outside their milieu, right, asked them about it. And that was the important part of what is a woman. So I do say you should, you should watch it if you have some time. It explains quite a lot. Um, so we are getting to Jennifer in a mo. I want to do our appeal for funding now. I'll keep it brief because we've got a, a big show today and it's kind of long, but really we're sticking around. So please do that. It will change the way you view this whole thing. Um, we need your support to keep the lights on around here and to keep doing the work we do. We don't just throw up guests. We do a ton of research and and uh, try to move the story along with every show. Whatever the story is, we're trying to move it along in some way. And we also vet our guests quite carefully too. So that takes time and effort. And, um, and I hope you appreciate it. And if you do, you can do that by subscribing to our Patreon, our Substack, or through PayPal. We are going to be moving mostly to Substack, but we'll take it anywhere you want to put it. Um, and um, we also have a merch store, which I always forget to mention, but we have some great stuff in there. We have one hat that's really important that says politically homeless which is how we all feel every election. Who do we vote for? I'm a one issue voter now, right? It's whoever is against lockdowns and masking going forward and who wants to maybe have a, a, an inquiry about how that happened. So I'm voting for you. That's my issue. Um, but I'm, you know, I was a lefty. I'm no long, I'm embarrassed by what the left is doing now. I don't agree with everything conservatives do always either. So what are we? You know, we're homeless. So there's an, a lovely little cap for you if you feel the same way that will support us. The other one is a little cap we did called Free the Fringe. And that's because I want to start pushing soon on the show the idea that charges against all of the uh, freedom truckers, including Tamara and Chris Barber, should be dropped, especially based on the dishonesty around the um, the Emergencies Act, which is horrific. But as I say, it's great because democracy is is working, and uh, the Liberal government is getting raked over the coals in the House by the Conservatives, who finally found their way. So that's really interesting. And they're making headway. Should be getting more publicity, but of course it's not because media was complicit, but we talk about that every week. So we'll move on. Um, so let's get back to, to what we're talking about today. And that is that our, our sons and our daughters are captured by an ideology that's pushing an unscientific orthodoxy and ushers them into life altering decisions before they are ready. And, uh, and if we ask for more information, 
many times we pay a price for, for doing so or advocating, right? You'll hear me talk in the interview with Jennifer about uh, this legislation that was passed here and that uh, Joe Biden either has or is going to pass any minute. And that is about banning conversion therapy. And, and this is how clever they are because obviously conversion therapy is awful. Gay people are gay and we shouldn't try to make them not gay and trying to do that was bad and we should always shun that and hate it and I agree with that. But here's what they did in Canada and they're doing it in the States too. They slip in gender identities other than cisgender. I can't believe they put that in a document, a federal government document. So what that means, I believe, is that um, if a therapist sees a kid and the kid has a states that they have some kind of gender issue, they have to treat them as if they have that gender issue. Not that maybe they have borderline personality disorder, depression, something else, and that it's manifesting maybe this way or it's something they heard in school and they're diagnosing themselves. They can't explore that. They can't explore it, right? It's, I believe it's like criminal. Federal government reintroduces legislation to criminalize conversion therapy related conduct in Canada. So that's really scary. And they're doing it and Biden is doing it too. They slipped that in and that's a completely different thing. It's hugely, hugely dishonest. So we have to be aware of these things. Um, corporations are very, very heavily involved in this now in supporting it. Schools are academia, as obviously I, I've said that. And if you, and if actual women like me, old time feminists say, wait a minute, don't change the language. Don't say that we have, you know, chests and not breasts. If you don't do that, we are attacked as being transphobic. And you saw what happened to JK Rowling, who has a brilliant history of social justice advocacy. She is not transphobic and neither am I. I just don't feel women should give up their womanhood and the idea of women in order to accommodate a small, using the prime minister's phrase, a small fringe minority of people who have this disorder, right? But that's where we are. And the other thing is that even questioning any of this is becoming criminalized. And if you mispronoun somebody, it, it can be criminal. I did a sub stack on a case in the UK where ch someone was going to bring charge. The police were going to bring charges against somebody. I mean, it's nuts. So we have to take a sober look at this. And one of the things I want to talk to you about before we get to Jennifer, which we'll do really quickly, is my experience of this type of phenomena that happened in the 90s when I was at the Fifth Estate doing some pretty decent investigative work, right? I've talked about it on the show before, but this is where the paradigm actually you know, it meets. It's the same. What happened was a part of academia, a part of psychotherapy and psychiatry had landed on this idea that satanic cults, which is to say groups of people who worship Satan were murdering babies and having rituals where they sexually abused children, many of them underneath daycare centers. That's, that's what they were saying. Oprah did a big show on it, so it must be true. And uh, of course, this was doing a ton of damage to people and charges were brought. Martin Preschool was the longest criminal trial before OJ, I think, in American history. People were charged. The, the, the charges were nonsense. The, the prosecutor in Martin Preschool actually resigned halfway through the case because it was so absurd. But what was driving it was politics and the ideology that children never don't tell the truth about sexual abuse. But what was happening is the kids were being interviewed by these interviewers who, on a mission to find it. Some of them were being bribed with food to admit things that didn't actually happen. It went on and on and on. There were day, daycare satanic outbreaks all over North America and the UK for a long, long time. And it ruined a lot of people's lives. And all of it was bunkum. There was never any evidence to support what was happening. The other side of it was that women were going into 
see psychiatrists and psychologists claiming depression, anorexia, whatever. And the shrinks who believed in this were diagnosing that they had been abused by a satanic cult, but didn't remember it. Right? They had no memory of abuse for 10 years by a satanic cult, frequently run by their parents. Right, So they had no memory of it. So they would leave the psychiatrist, the psychologist's office, believing they'd been abused by their parents in this cult. And the reason they didn't believe it was, be, or the reason they didn't remember it was because they developed 50 different personalities. They had multiple personality disorder and the personalities were holding those memories. That's why they didn't remember. I am serious, folks. That actually happened. It was supported by mainstream science. Ontario, Canada was sending these multiple personality women down to a very, very expensive clinic in Texas for treatment at a cost of about 40,000 bucks per person, I believe per month, right? How do I know that? I interviewed them. And when it was over, when everybody came to their senses, they're like, well, yeah, that didn't happen. And no, I don't really, you know, I mean, it just, it just kind of ended one day and it was ended by the courts. They, they couldn't get convictions in the criminal cases. Um, people started to examine the ideology much more, more closely and they realized it w didn't make any sense. And, and more so that um, insurance companies didn't want to fund psychologists and psychiatrists who were doing this because they were losing lawsuits in court when people realized, you know, they'd been hosed and uh, wanted their lives back and that they'd falsely accused their parents of being in a coven. I mean, that's what was actually literally happening. So how is this similar? It's similar in a couple of ways. That academia was sort of captured, psychiatry parts of it were captured, that there were psychologists who totally believed that if you tried to challenge them, you were a bad person who didn't care that kids were being abused. I interviewed one, I interviewed many, many practitioners of this and none of them wanted to talk about the fallacies in what they were doing. And one of the people I interviewed reacted very much like in the Matt Walsh um, a documentary where I pushed him and he said, I'm not going to continue with this. And I was being perfectly polite, but I was pushing him on the illogic of, of what he was proposing, right? Once you back them into a corner, logically, all they can do is say, I'm stopping the interview. And that's what Matt Walsh did. So it's very, very similar here. Criticizing it was, was mean, you know, and uh, we got in trouble. We did two documentaries, uh, one of which I believe is still taught at Harvard um, in psychiatry. And uh, we were pilloried by our feminist sisters who thought that we were not supporting women who were claiming to have been abused. So there you go. Those are the similarities in the two stories. I felt it in my gut when I saw this thing growing the trans extremism, it was the same. It's being driven by psychiatrists and psychologists who are finding it wherever they look. And um, I, I think we really have to start looking at this seriously. One other similarity, the woman in back in the day when I was reporting on that stuff, who was blowing it up is a memory expert named Elizabeth Loftus. And she was so hated, she's a psychologist, right? She was so hated for calling bullshit that um, she had to go to the conferences, the psychiatric conferences they held with, with bodyguards and security. Right? And they still go after her frequently. They, they can't give it up, even though, you know, it's been changed in the DSM-4 or DSM-3, whatever it was, they changed it to dissociative disorder from multiple personality disorder. I blame Oprah for that. Anyway, um, so uh, th this feels very much like that to me, only with big money and big tech behind it. So it's much scarier and much more permeating, permeating the media. So I just, before we go to Jennifer, I just want to read this to you. This is what she wrote, and it's really interesting. 
She says, I write at the intersection of humanity, technology, and runaway capitalism. At this intersection stands transgenderism, what I believe is a glamorous ad campaign generated by elites invested in tech and pharma to normalize the changing of human biology. I believe this because I have researched the money behind the rapidly growing juggernaut of transgenderism in American culture and beyond, and it all leads back to the pharmaceutical and tech giants that now interface with LGBT NGOs, which are driving the normalization of a biology-denying ideology. This ideology has taken the bullet train of postmodernism to the juncture we are at now. The LGB civil rights movement has been subsumed by elites who have added the T to normalize the overriding of our sexual reality as humans, staging a political coup of mammoth proportions. So here's my interview with Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm great, Trish. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on. I... Uh, have been trying to, we've been trying to, to do this for some time. I've been speaking to you um, either, well, on email, and we had a really long phone call one day too, yeah, quite a while ago, yeah, where we really bonded over some of the ways of looking at this because there was a paradigm in my past that we'll talk about a little bit later. But, um, but I got bogged down in covering the COVID-19 uh, public policy disaster paradigm, which was about as complicated as this is too. And right. also, interestingly, it requires the same kind of dastardly professional groupthink um, that this does. It's remarkable. I don't think people understand how much this actually happens, you know, that people in certain professions come to believe a thing that is later under close examination, kind of proven to be difficult or troublesome or something. So um, there, there's a correlation there. But I, I just yes. want to, you know, I'm glad you're here. For my listeners, um, you know, this is how I, I want them to view this. And that is how do we go from zero to 60 with the trans extremism? We went from like not hearing about it, not talking about it. All of us, myself included, feel that people who are born really feeling they're in the wrong body deserve our love and care. Uh, but that's not where we are. We're now taking over language, taking over education, taking over medicine, taking over uh, le legislation, some of which here is is becoming kind of frightening. So my question for you, Jennifer, sorry for going on, is how did we go from zero to 60 on the trans stuff so quickly? How'd that happen? Um, well, as I perceive it, well, it hasn't really been quick. What has been quick, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's quick is it's um, the, the way that it was dropped into the culture and, you know, that it looks like, oh, we went from, you know, zero to 100 in, <laughs> you know, uh, 10 years. Um, but it's actually been happening behind the scenes. The political infrastructure for driving this ideology through the culture um, has been happening for many, many more years than what we can actually see, unless of course you're researching it like myself. Um, this word transgenderism, which I really detest um, and I've stopped pretty much using it, um, is just because it has no borders. You know, it, it can mean like so many different things to so many people and gender is the same way. It's become uh, a way to obscure what it is that we're talking about. Um, and the word uh, is rooted in transsexualism, which is a fetish of adult men. Right. So, um, you know, I think that's a pretty hard sell to the public. So it's been it's been uh, dropped into the culture as transgenderism and it's been marketed to the public as um, sort of body dysphoria initially but it's you know it is morphing you know and has morphed since it was dropped into the culture um, and into the LGB organizations the umbrella of LGB well, what's interesting about it, having uh, read a lot of your writing and other people, too, who are writing about this uh, thoughtfully, 
it's not only morphed, but as it morphed, it becomes amorphous. In other words, it has less shape and tends now to encompass a whole bunch of stuff that is neither really provable nor um, nor, nor, nor created or even understood through actual data, right? It's just if you feel this way, if you think this way, then it's a thing. Right. Basically, um, you know, at root, this is a, uh, it's, it's a religious cult, uh, a technological religious cult, and it's being driven. It looks like it's coming out of the universities and then it's being institutionalized elsewhere but it's actually coming from uh, billionaires in the uh, tech and the techno-medical complex, actually, um, that are invested in um, unmooring us from our roots in sex so that they can tie us um, more intrinsically to technology than we already are. Now, that sounds a little like, woohoo, like a little sci-fi, right? Yeah. But, you know, people don't even realize because it happened so gradually that this is already underway. I mean, we're all glued to our computers, to our cell phones. Uh, the whole COVID crisis has really um, accentuated that. You know, we speak to each other over, over Zoom and other platforms. You know, we talk to each other on social media. Um, and we've outsourced our memory to our iPhones, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's a, Not it's just a hard that, drive. I mean, I mean, a lot of people are outsourcing their sexuality to to online platforms. You know, uh, I mean, the most intimate part of their expressions as a human being are, are being, you know, uh, sort of consumed by tech. And so this is driven into the next generation. What's really happening is that they really want the next generation on board very, very quickly because they're trying to, uh, how shall I say, um, very quickly meld us more, you know, like I said, intrinsically to technology, to AI. Um, all the big technology companies are, you know, uh, tell, and the economic forums as well are telling you what they're doing, but nobody's really listening or connecting this to this particular issue because this is presented as a human rights movement. So let's let's just walk back where how you came to believe what you just said, right? So so interesting for me is following the money on these things. Always, always, you know, you can follow the money and find something interesting. And and what you found, as I understand it, was that um, the LGB community was once certain rights had accrued to that group, they had trouble raising money because there weren't a ton of human rights um, fights left once they gay people could get married and could adopt children, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and those things were kind of codified. They couldn't raise the money that they used to because they weren't really at risk in the same way they legitimately had been before. So at, at some point, as I understand from speaking to you before, um, the trans people with money kind of infiltrated that group, right? And tell, tell me how that happened. You know, when the human rights movement was coming up um, here in the United States, uh, there was an outbreak, a virus, viral outbreak, AIDS. And so the medical industrial complex immediately became involved in this human rights movement. Um, and they never left, basically. So when AIDS became, uh, you know, got under control, then there was a new, you know, a new issue. Because now you have these, all these organizations that have been, com that have come up to service, you know, educational and counseling services for gay men and and the rest of the world the rest of the community the um the government the united united states government actually asked the pharmaceutical industry to bring down the cost of these um treatments because you know it was completely out of hand and when they did that you know the uh it started to quell this epidemic and but you know the pharmaceutical industry uh was already involved in this community now. So 
um, it kind of grew from there. You know, uh, you have you make I, corporate I, they made corporate identities out of this community, which is just same sex attraction. I mean, lesbian, gay, and bisexual be, became corporate identities. Um, you know, you had gay bookstores and gay clubs and gay this and gay that, you know, gay towns um, servicing this community. So it became a sort of constituency that the LGB, now T, can market to other corporations. Like if you get on, bar, on board with our community, we will give you our loyalty. Yeah. The constituent, you know, the, the loyalty of our constituency. So they started to cross market with other corporations and they became quite a Goliath. I mean, they're now like $3.6 trillion large, you know, uh, and outright out uh, leadership is the uh, business arm of the LGBT. So if you, you want to go over there and check out, you know, what that looks like, you can certainly do that. Um, but then, you know, you have this, uh, you have lesbian, gay, bisexual, and heterosexual people. Now you want to open your markets. Well, under capitalism, because you want to grow, right? So how are you going to do that with a sexually dimorphic species? It's impossible to open up markets in sexual identity unless you break the boundary between male and female. But, so but I guess what I was also getting at, Jennifer, is the idea that because the trans community was arguing again that their rights were violated. It provided a way for for the the sort of LGB groups to then be you know start raising money. They were able to kind of monetize that, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But it's also a way of giving rights to a fiction, sort of like we gave rights to corporations that aren't people. We gave them the rights of personhood, right? Well, this is this is another way, you know, this is another thing that's happening here is they're giving rights to uh, a subset of humanity that doesn't really exist. It's an illusion. I mean, people have dysphoria, body dysphoria. Of course they do, sure. But that doesn't mean that they have this, you know, they're not an identity. They're not a subset of humanity. They just take drugs and surgeries to alleviate their body dysphoria. So tell me about um, this article that you wrote in Tablet. It's quite interesting. The headline is The Billionaire Family Pushing Synthetic Sex Identities. And what you explain in this, it's a really well-sourced article, is the idea that there's a lot of big, big money behind this movement, which kind of explains how it is, you know, bursting up into powerful places right now. Tell me about... Uh, about the, the, the money behind this, the powerful people behind this movement? Okay, so, well, you know, I wrote about the Pritzkers. Um, I was invited to do so by Tablet Magazine, actually. And um, I had written about them in 2018. Um, when I, you know, after I started researching this, um, I kept running into them and I collected a lot of information about them. They were everywhere, this issue was, they were everywhere. And um, so I started to dig really, really deeply into what they were doing. And I wrote this article, um, which I had to publish in The Federalist because, um, you know, nobody on the left would touch it. <laughs> right. Um, so I did just to get the information out there, even though I'm, you know, of the left originally. Um, yeah. Now I'm politically homeless like most of us. Yeah, we've got a hat um, for that in our merch store, by the way. <laughs> There's so many of us now, you know, I'm, I'm trying to monetize that for the show. I mean, it's it's insane how many people say I, you know, I'm from the left, but don't know where I am right now, especially on issues like this. Anyway, go ahead. So you couldn't get it, you know, so. Yeah, so, so I published this yeah. article and over the years I've been writing and writing about this and people really appreciate it. And, you know, I've uncovered a lot of things about the money. But this particular article really spoke to people and still speaks to people all these years later. <clears throat> so the tablet magazine, you know, approached me and said, you know, would you do an update? And um, I just happen to have like all this new information, you know, like percolating in the back of my head that I had to do a piece on, I had to do a piece on. And they asked me and it was just perfect timing, you know, so um, I let loose and basically so what did you learn? Tell me about the Pritzkers. I know they're connected to Chicago and it's major 
super duper money. But how are they connected to the trans situation that's unfolding now? Okay, well, probably first and foremost um, is Jennifer Pritzker, who was who is a retired um, army lieutenant, I think it is, colonel, lieutenant, whatever, in the services. And um, he's been married and fathered three children. And in middle age, he decided, uh, or not even middle age, I think he was in his 60s, he decided that he's going to claim womanhood for himself. So the whole family is on board with this. His brother was not his brother, J.B. Pritzker, the governor of um, Chicago, had said that he had no problem with his cousin's uh, identity. Um, he had more of a problem with him being a Republican, <laughs> which I go. always thought was really funny. It is funny. So <laughs> when you say that he, you know, had he had adopted a female persona, that he claims to be trans. Is that correct? And lives well, as a he woman now. He 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 um he claims to be trans, but what does that actually mean? Do you know well, what I mean? I, so. Yeah. But I'm not uh, just talking about in our parlance these days. That, that he, he lives as a woman, I guess, right? Uh, I don't know what that means, to live as a woman. You either have female biology or you don't. I mean, there's no living as a woman. What does a woman live as? You know, there's, there's millions of different types of women, and they live in millions of different types of ways. The only thing really connecting them as women is their female biology. And okay, so let me let me put it this way. So he's a man who has adopted female, traditional female. He dresses in dresses. He is that right? Stereotypes. He's adopted stereotypes. Yeah. Yeah. He's had surgeries, and I'm assuming he takes drugs to sort of solidify this uh, synthetic sex identity, but it's not real. So you know, the title of my article says that straight up. Uh, what we're what he's manifesting here, and what this family is manifesting through their donations and their philanthropic um, funding, is uh, the adoption of synthetic sex identities, identities that are not organic, not real. They're fake. And so, when did he adopt this? How old was he? Where was he in life? He was in his sixties. It was in the 2000s, early 2000s, I think. I've forgotten now. Okay. Um, I have so much information swirling around in my head. It's, it's amazing I remember anything at all. <laughs> and, um, and also, just so people understand that it was the Pritzkers who put Obama in office, too. So they're a big deal. You know, they... Oh, you know, so Penny Pritzker influential. is... Uh, yeah, P Penny Pritzker was his Secretary of Commerce. Um, she also helped get him elected into the White House. And um, J.B. Pritzker is passing all of this, um, these uh, bills to bring gender identity into grade schools. Um, and um, Jennifer Pritzker is, uh, you know, has the Tuani Foundation, which he uses to just shower universities and medical institutions with gobs of money. Um, I think the Pritzkers were the first family to have a university medical center named after them because of the, such, uh, you know, such a huge donation. And that was the Pritzker School of Medicine in Chicago. And um, so after that, they just continued to do that. And um, with that, these institutions were adopting this ideology of gender identity. And, um, and they just continued from there. That was like the early 2000s. And, you know, uh, they've been funding millions and millions of dollars to many, many different institutions, educational, uh, medical, the arts, um, and with it, these institutions adopt this ideology. And this is how it's, it's, um, it's brought into the culture. So medical schools are doing the surgeries and other institutions they fund are on board with the ideology, right? Is that, is that right, how it's... Right, right. And the LG, they work hand in hand with the LGB, now T, organizations, uh, the NGOs, to, to drive this ideology. Now, I, as I was reading this, I, I realized that also, did some of that money 
come into Canada as well, or is that the money from um, someone else? Who, the, yes. I, yes. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Pritzker funds the, um, he funds the Bonham Center. Who, Bonham is another, uh, Mark S. Bonham is another um, a very, very wealthy man um, who started a sexuality center in Canada and um, Pritzker, not that he really needs Pritzker's money, but Pritzker, you know, sent him, you know, he, he's been funding this organization, which basically teaches that sexual dimorphism is not real. Right. Meaning that there aren't two sexes. That's what that means. Um, right. So, so I'm just looking and here. Also, yeah. And also uh, he funds the, um, he funded the first quote unquote transgender uh, chair position up in Victoria university in british columbia and in 2016 they had this trans chair uh aaron dever had uh and she's a woman actually and she she um she claims a <clears throat> synthetic male identity and um she ha initiated this program called moving trans history forward so basically promoting uh transgender you know having a history and then moving it forward. So are we talking about moving body dysphoria forward? Like, what does that mean exactly? Um, but anyway, one of the speakers there was um, <clears throat> Martine Rothblatt, who is um, a very interesting individual. Um, he um, co-founded Sirius XM radio, satellite radio. He worked on the Human Genome Project he has a xenotransplantation farm. What does for that transplant, mean? Uh, you know, for transplanting um, organs from animals into humans. Right. He's made a robot of his wife. Um, yes, I read he's, that. I read he's that. He started a um, technological religious um, religion called Terrorism, which he doesn't bother hiding at all. Um, and basically, everybody is working off of his ideology. Um, not just his ideology, but he's made it actually into a religion. He's written extensively about it. He, um, he's written um, from transgender to transhuman. He perceives transgenderism, transgenderism as an on-ramp to transhumanism. And in fact, it really is a grooming process, you know, getting the culture ready for more and more, you know, um, transitioning away from our natural self. You know, uh, our sex is really our connection to the biosphere. So, you know, transgenderism and trans, you know, transing your sex is a means to grooming people to accept greater and greater changes to our physical self and our connection to the biosphere. Now, let me, I just want to clarify something. So you're, you're pronouncing um, Rothblatt as a he, but this is a person who lives as a woman, right? Just so people understand his, his, her interest in this is that he considers himself a woman. He's a trans woman, right? And therefore that is why the, the funding is, is happening and also was the owner of Sirius Satellite Radio, correct? Yes, and he also <clears throat> uh, authored the first gender bill you know, all these gender bills that we have floating around. So G123 and the gender bills in the US and Scotland and Ireland, all these gender bills to bring gender identity into the law. He was the author of the first gender bill. He and several other, um, at the, that point, they were transvestites. They dressed in women's clothing and they got together lawyers and they spoke about their proclivities and they decided to normalize this. They wanted to normalize this within the law and I said earlier, I mentioned this is a this is an, a, this is really a fetish of men owning female biology. So it's really taking it to its zenith. Uh, what's happening now? Men in women's sports, men claiming womanhood for themselves. You know the erasure of female language. You know uh, denoting our bodies. You know and in being inclusive of of men. Um, men taking the scholarships in universities that belong to women, um, you know, men being in women's prisons, you know, uh, and it goes on and on and on. Well, it's, I have to tell you something. It is, it, my personal experience with this is hugely limited, except the bathroom thing, which bugs me. 
um, that I, you know, I feel, especially at my age, like, I, like we're being erased now, that, that there's no, that we have no, I, I feel like women's rights are being stripped away. We're being erased. We're being erased from the language. We don't have the privacy of a, a female only bathroom. Now, a lot of companies just do unisex and I'm in the production business. I don't want to go into a bathroom that an 18 year old audio tech is just, you know, kind of whatever used, right? I, I don't, I, I feel like I can't change from that and that it's not fair to ask us to cede all of this territory. And I guess why your work is so interesting to me is that that what you're saying is this isn't happening organically, right? It, th th we're not talking about this because there's a jillion trans people who need to be <laughs> heard, right? We're talking about this right. because there's a lot of rich people with a vested interest in pushing this for their own reasons, whatever they may be. That's what we need to understand. So what you're talking about, though, just so people are clear, oh is that this is a big industry now, the surgery, oh, the huge. drugs, all that. Like, oh, like talk God, about huge. that. Talk about that. Well, it intersects with, I mean, the medical industrial complex, most people don't know this, but the medical industrial complex is bigger than the military industrial complex. Um, it's huge. I mean, it covers the globe. It's everywhere. I mean, in America, in America, uh, it, you know, most of us know this in America. I mean, do you know anybody that's not taking any medications over the age of like, I don't know, 20? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's crazy. And, and, and the older you get, the more and more, I mean, I have, you know, I know people that are taking vast amounts of medication every day. It's wild. So this is an industry that needs to grow or die. You know, they need to open markets constantly. And so here it's just an opening of markets, you know, and it's also an opening of the, um, of, uh, the infertility market. You know, uh, the, you're sterilizing an awful lot of children and you're promoting this as normal. So, so much, you know, you're creating a contagion of young people that are, <laughs> you know, just going along with this program. It's, it's being, you know, marketed over technology. There are, there are social media platforms by surgeons, by pharmaceutical corporations, by influencers. It's all over their social media. This is progressive. This is good. If you have any kind of feeling when you're an adolescent of being uncomfortable in your body, oh, you must be trans, you must be trans, you must be trans. Yeah, yeah. You know? And they're marketing, they're, they're aggressively marketing it. Yeah. Um, they're in, and what it is, it is disembodiment, disassociation from your natural body. This is being promoted as normal. And there is a reason for this. They are trying, they're talking about this all over again, all over the place. I mean, with Mark Zuckerberg, he, he's talking about a metaverse. You know, connecting people to a metaverse. You know, uh, Elon Musk is talking about a neural link. Uh, Martine Rothblatt is selling us on um, transhumanism. Uh, well, so West, Klaus the, Schwab, that's in his book Klaus too, Schwab, right? Yeah. 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 And um, yeah. these big players that are, are, you know, funding this and driving this, you know, you have also um, Brooke Marciniak, who was one of the head people at Ernst & Young, you know, yeah. investment house, um, you know, promoting equality for women She's part of the outright leadership, out leadership also. She actually is a co-chair with Martine Rothblatt at out leadership of their, um, uh, it's a promotion of like women, equality for women, which is hilarious. Equality for women when you're inviting this man to be, be a co-chair with you. Yeah, I mean. And she promotes the equality of women in sports. And at the same time, she's, uh, you know, she's helping to deconstruct this within these um, major sports organizations. Me you know, meaning, by adding meaning in, that she's wanting these um, I, female identifying males to be able to compete with women. Yes, right? absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's shocking, I, I, I feel sorry for those poor kids. The other, I, well, I just, uh, before we move on from the money, I, I just wanna uh, talk more about the profit motive here and get a, a sense from you of how big this now is as an industry and what it entails you know you've got you've got the sh the head shrinkage part of it now right the gender affirming psychotherapy well, for you kids have, who are... um, 
you know, tell me about that. You know, I'd say 15 years ago, I think the first transgender clinic for kids was like in 2007. And now there's over 400 of those in the um, in the United States, wow. in Northern America, I should say. And um, there's uh, over a thousand globally that we know of. This yeah. is that we know of. And this was brought to us by the Gender Mapper Project, a woman who started a project of contacting these gender clinics and asking people what they'll actually do to children and at what age. Um, and she had all sorts of volunteers calling as if they were parents and saying, oh, my, my kid is this age, da, 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 this is what they want. Can you do this for us? You know, so she's and she's got a lot of them on um, on record on audio and um, and she's made a, an entire map, which is just extraordinary to, to look at. Um, what does it and show? So you have, what does the map well, it show? shows where all the gender clinics are, you know, that they've found. Um, last year, one popped up in China. The first in China popped up. Um, and, and, and the gender know, clinic, just let me be clear for the for our listeners, a gender clinic is a clinic where if your child is feeling not great about something, maybe they're depressed, maybe they're anorexic, whatever, and there's also a component of any magnitude, tiny or large, they go to these places and they are they are funneled into something called gender affirming care right these places are not places that investigate what's really going on once the child identifies as having a gender issue that's how they're treated and i just want to repeat something i said in the opening that in canada that is part of the um uh conversion therapy bill so that not only can we not try to turn gay people straight, which we shouldn't be doing, it's a terrible thing and a shame on all of us for ever doing it, but they've lumped in this, the, the gender identity stuff. So it makes me wonder, given that it's now illegal, to question that if therapists, if any therapists in Canada can say, well, I don't think this child's problem is that they're actually the opposite sex. I, I think they have... Uh, borderline personality disorder or something, right? I, I don't think therapists here are allowed. They're not allowed. No, they're, they're not, not allowed. allowed to evaluate that at all. Yeah, I mean, it's the kid says they're trans and, you know, that's it, you know. And again, what is trans? What is gender? What is a gender clinic? What What is gender? I know. Nobody's just... ever told us what that is. Yeah. You know, when the, even these organizations that talk about gender and gender identity, they're all circular. I don't know if you saw the new uh, Matt Walsh uh, documentary where saw he goes it. around and he, yeah, you saw, saw it? it. Yep, yeah, yep, it's really yep. great. It's great. I mean, he's it so deadpan and he's, and he's asking these people a reasonable question. You know, like, what is it? Well, um, it, the, none the of them thing can answer about, him. Nobody can answer. And the thing about that doc that I liked, I was prepared to think he was a bit glib, but then I saw it and I thought, gee, this is very Michael Moore-ish, you know, on the right. It's <laughs> it like is, if Michael Moore was a conservative, right? <laughs> because think yeah. about it. Michael Moore did Bowling for Columbine. He yep, did Fahrenheit yep, yep. 9 Love, really serious topics, and he made uh -huh. a dent by being kind of glib. That's how he got it. Right. But what struck me about this film, having done the films about ritual abuse and multiple personality disorder, was that when the practitioners of this are pushed to justify with data or facts what they are doing, they try to shut the interview down. It is an exact... Right paradigm that is what he exposed the what is a woman stuff is is funny and and kind of a head scratcher i thought it was really important the way he very politely said well you know lupron is used as a a chemical castration and she's like i don't think we should talk about this anymore like they yeah. they can't it's a time and, and, and that young man who was the gender prof of some sort kept saying i'm not going to talk to you when 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 walsh was pushing him to explain in layman's terms without the jargon what he actually this is thought. classic classic cult indoctrination these people are indoctrinated you know, just like any cult member would I agree. be. I and agree. this is what happens when you confront a person in a cult with any kind of logic that goes against, you know, their view. They'll shut you down. And, you know, and they X out people in their lives that don't agree with them. 
Well, we saw that, interestingly, we saw this in COVID, right? If, if you said to somebody, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you're still supporting the vax, you've had four boosters and six bouts of COVID, maybe you should rethink your position. <laughs> you know, they look at you like you're completely nuts and they, they, they actually go a bit on tilt. And, and I yeah. feel in a broader way, I've learned this from covering the last two years, all this insanity. I think that Western culture Somebody in one of the pieces I read called it weird. It was like Western something, something rich, developed countries, you know, the UK, Canada, America, that we have lost our minds and that there is a certain section of the population, uh, part of what we would call glibly woke ideology, who have gone mad. And yes. who are in a cult, right? It's that they line, are. They are in know, a cult. It's like I support the the current thing. I don't care what it is, but I'll be part of the mob. What if it's vaccines or supporting, you know, an unwinnable war in Ukraine in which lots of people are dying, or or trans rights, even if I can't explain what that means. Like that, it, it's it's kind of like the fall of Western civil uh, civilization in in a sense, right? I'm gonna yeah. find out what yeah. that was. Glenn Lowry did some interesting stuff on this, and he um, he put out a letter from a trans person who was quite thoughtful about it, and she used that word weird, and I loved it because I feel like that's, here we are, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, where this ideology has taken root. That's the funny thing in Matt Walsh, too. He's over there in Africa, and the people are looking at him like he's nuts. What are you talking about, man becoming women, right? <laughs> so, sorry, I, yeah, I'm talking too much. Probably I should let you talk more. I just wanted to talk about Matt Walsh. No, 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 I've, been okay. thinking, I've been thinking a lot about it. So I think it serves a purpose. And I'm I'm surprised that a lot of serious people are taking what he did quite seriously. So props to him. It's getting millions of views. Um, it's wonderful. Wonderful. It's wonderful. So we were that, talking about how... I think the ground how, is shifting. Sorry. And I think that you, the backlash yeah. is going to be, is going to be fierce going to be really fierce. I mean, they have built up an incredible political infrastructure to drive this ideology. And it's already in all of our institutions. It's in the market, which is really, really terrifying. I mean, you can get it out of the institutions, but getting it out of the market, it's kind of like, oh, let's, let's get rid of porn. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. That's like laughable. You know what I mean? It's like it, porn is connected to everything because it's so huge. It's such a huge industry. Um, and everything intersects in the market. So it's like, it's like a web, you know what I mean? You like, how do you get it out once it's in? I mean, there's these gender clinics, there's modeling agencies for, Ugh. you know, for trans people with, you know, people with synthetic sex identities. And there's, um, there's makeup for people with synthetic sex identities and there's clothing, you know, marketed for people with synthetic sex identities and now children with synthetic sex identities. There's packers for people with synthetic sex identities. There's, um, you know, there's uh, therapists for people with synthetic sex identities. There are uh, clinics and surgeons, specialized surgeon and specialized uh, surger surgery techniques and research and drugs and um you know not just the cross-sex hormones but any kind of antibiotics you know that you're going to need once you start you know uh, doing surgeries on people and and pain medication and there's all sorts of drugs the anti-rejection medications you know uh it's just it just goes on and on and on how it's everywhere you, now it's everywhere now and i think we are at a bit of a tipping point and i think that matt's film came at exactly exactly the right time and maybe a little bit of humor and and bewilderment oh i think the humor in that thing was such a relief it was yeah. and also our comedians you know i mean it was really really brilliant that Chappelle came out i mean that was huge yeah and i left my head Bill off Mar, yeah yeah me too me too and that he's so brilliant anyway um and uh, Bill Maher, um, you know, came, you know, fairly quickly on his heels and he was great. I mean, I, I was, you know, he shocked me, yeah. you know, that he went there. Um, and then Ricky Gervais, you know, came yes, out. So yes. it, I, and before that, I had just written a piece uh, about Tucker Carlson. Like, why is our, you know, why is the host of a conservative news site becoming our new uh, comedian? You know, <laughs> like we can't go anywhere and, and, and have our comedians aren't funny anymore. 
But well, you, Tucker you, you, Carlson is a riot. I mean, I you watch him and he's he talking funny. about this issue. He's yeah. hilarious. Well, and, and 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 the what he does is he points out the absurdity of us having to play ball with this, right? It's like right. Right. But when you it's funny because when you and I talked on the phone, we had this very long chat. And one of the things we talked about was Tucker Carlson as two women who'd kind of come from the left on this. And all of a sudden, the only person making sense in a big public venue is a right wing talk show host named Tucker Carlson, who <laughs> is the bravest guy because he was on this way before. Like he was yeah. on this two years ago, yeah. three years ago. Right. He, and he's actually first on many, many issues, whether people like it, is. Uh, which yep. is why he's been a target. But yep. you and I were talking about how we had to keep our our kind of uh, our fangirlness around Tucker a bit of a secret because people <laughs> people think you're mental, right? If you, especially if they're on the left, or how can you? And I, I'm saying like actually, he's been right about like most stuff, and he's right first. Yeah, you know what's really interesting to me is how how triggered people are, you know, by Tucker, by Trump, by yeah, um, yeah. by Ben Shapiro. Like people on the left are absolutely triggered. You know, yeah. oh, I saw this thing on on Ben Shapiro, or I, you know, Ben Shapiro said this thing, or Tucker Carlson said this thing, and they absolutely lose their shit. Yeah, and it's hilarious to me. It's like it's just it's just another part of the conversation. Yeah. It's not I, an endorsement of everything this person has ever said, or even their predominant uh, ideological bent. Do you know what I mean? It's just part of a conversation, like just ease up, you know, take the, take the, uh, take the, the pedal off the metal. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and we live in an era now where the, you know, the mainstream media is so corrupt, obviously, that him kind of giving the big old finger nightly on a lot of these things um, is, is really a public service. I hate to say it, I know I might get mail, but I, I'm sorry, I, I rarely miss him now. And part of the time I'm laughing at what he's saying because yep, he's yep, kind yep, of he's a comedian. So funny. He always says, well, how does, he says, how does that work? You know, that's his big <laughs> line, right? Um, but he's mostly right. And the show was well researched. And I defy people, you know, to who criticize Tucker Carlton to take apart what he's saying on the basis of the actual thing he said, not doing these like, you know, Media Matters for America, which is the devil in my view, it's an arm of the Hillary Clinton DNC, um, is always trying to have him deplatformed and his advertisers taken away. But they never do it because he's actually said or done what they say he said or done. They make it up or they right. gaslight in some way, right? So right. here we are, these kind of feminist chicks, formerly on the left now celebrating you know, this right of center, if we call each other that even anymore, a uh, commentator who's hated by most of our friends and my and <laughs> my family too, right? It's really weird. It's really weird. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, we, we, we've talked about the business of the, this, which I, I really want my listeners to understand kind of what's going on behind the scenes. This um, Martine Rothblatt, she lives, I believe, in Toronto now, and a, a lot of money has been um, spent by her in in I think in various hospitals here too. So, it's it's going everywhere, and that is why we're being told what we're being told. You know the universities that are pushing this. I, I went to look at the website of this this place at U of T that you mentioned the Bonham this Bonham place. I'd never heard of it. Why would I? And um, and what uh, the website's scary. And they're also get this. This is what really drove me nuts. They're, they're the ones advising some school people, education leaders, on how to deal with these issues in school, right? right. They're, they're right. experts now. I mean, I don't... Right. Well, this is how they intersect with the LGB, uh, now T. Um, they, you know, they, um, they drive this ideology into the LGBTs, and the, this political infrastructure, the LGBT infrastructure, is just ginormous. I mean, if, you could, if I could just make a picture of it, it would be amazing. But yeah. it's just too big. It's, it's absolutely Goliath, and it covers the globe. Um, they're everywhere. And so, you know, this ideology um, of disembodiment is, is part of this human rights framework. that They've driven it there, right? Mm -hmm. um, the men with this paraphilia. Yeah. Pritzker, Rothblatt, and others, you know, so then the LGBT organizations go into these ins other institutions and, you know, they're the experts. 
because they're part of the LGB, right? And so people think, oh, well, they must know about the human rights of LGB uh, plus T, right? Yeah. So this just must be progressive and good. And they sell it. They've sold it as, you know, poor, you know, it, it, it came in as, oh, progressive and brave. These men on the covers of magazines in, you know, uh, stereotypical, you know, sexualized women's garb, you know, uh, with Laverne beards, Cox, with, with beards. <laughs> I mean, that's the you big know, thing, because that's really in your face when you see. I mean, it's just it's an absolute insanity. It is. Insane. And, and, and you know what it is? That people, you know, take this on like they just gobble it up. Like nobody said anything when Bruce Jenner was on the cover of Vanity Fair. But he even he says it goes too far. Like he, he actually or she has been pretty interesting in some of the pushback around this. Let me just ask, ask you this, because I, I think about this a lot, especially in relation to this issue and then and COVID and some other things I've experienced in my life. Why do you think people have accepted this un, un, unfailingly? You know, I, I saw a video the other day of a drag queen story hour and the drag queen was wearing fake breasts. Um, I saw like it. Huge, I, I, it was just, I mean, when I, you know, like 10 it's years It's fascinating ago, to watch people accept it, that. It's accepted. fascinating to watch. It's fascinating to watch people uh, involved in a reality TV program about a young, a young man's, at that point, boy's uh, castration. I mean, People Magazine and the, the Jazz Jennings show, Jazz is a boy, you yeah. know, who has a synthetic uh, woman identity now. Um, and I mean, since he was little, he's been doing the, the talk show circuit yeah. and his all his surgeries have been on his reality show, you know, yes. and People Magazine celebrated his castration before before it actually happened. They had a big, you know, penis cake for him. And, you know, they, they covered this, you know, like this is celebratory castration. Now, you know, why is the public going along with this? Like, is, this is a really good question. Uh, and, and let me just say that this video I saw of the drag queen, it was in a bar of some sort, a giant right. fake breasts, right. female breasts, dancing around uh, tables with, fam it was a family restaurant. There was a child in the picture, in, in the video, who gave the dancing huge fake breasted and i mean i mean uncovered breasts she she was not wearing a top um i mean it was a sexual performance and this child is prompted i guess by the family to tip her as if she's a stripper like what the, and, and and you know what was interesting about it if you watch it again the drag queen even knows it's inappropriate and you know what they do he puts or she puts their arms over the naked fake breasts in front of the child like mm -hmm. even he or she whatever recognized that the family didn't the family the kid was sitting on like grandma's knee at a, right. i mean I, I, it's wild it's so my, wild. my my point is what what has happened in the culture that we accept weirder and stranger and more sexualized things in front of our children and around our children and it's like we're not allowed to react somehow. I, I just, I, I don't, it, well, it feels like the know, fall of Rome to me. It, it is. Like well, it really, it's very, very similar, I think. Um, but it's really amped up, actually. It's probably worse because it's amped up on tech. You know, tech has developed so much that we are so dissociated. We, we, we take in so much information that we're not really built for like all of the traumas of the world. I mean, you know, you go back a hundred years, people had a trauma in their little community. You knew about the trauma in your little community, not the community across the world. You know, we take in wars, we take in awful, awful information and tons of it. We're absolutely traumatized. We can't move. People that are traumatized, they, they, they dissociate and they also, they're, they're shocked, they stop. You know, they're, they're traumatized, they stop in place, like because they're shocked, right? So this is kind of what's happening to us. We're being inundated with sex with sex, and more and more aberrant forms of sex and, and uh, fetishes, which are really, it's just, um, I mean, I'm not a prude or anything. It's just that, you know, 
uh, fetishes, you know, they dissociate, they're obsessive and they, they, they're dissociative and um, they're compulsions. You know, they're not about intimacy. You know, they're, it's objectification, like the fetish of transsexualism. It objectifies female biology, you know, uh, and dissociates you from yourself. You want to own this other person's biology that's not yours. It's, it's objectifying. The whole, the whole thing is objectifying, but we can't even see that. When I tell people that the whole thing is fetishizes human sex, they don't understand that. They can't understand that because we're already so far divorced from our natural organic roots that, that we just can't even feel that. We can't feel that a little boy is being castrated. When we look at people, mag we can't feel it. We're inured. Because of everything that's that's presented to us over our tech, I, I believe that some of us can. I, I believe that the people who do see it maybe most clearly are the women they now call turfs. You know, I, I'm of right. a certain age. I was never in. I'm, I'm old enough that I was not indoctrinated by the internet or anything online. I've had my children. I've, you know, I was a, and I consider myself a feminist. I also was, by the way, a massive uh, gay ally back in the day when what they now call cisgendered women mm -hmm. were the natural allies of the gay community. And I fought like hell with them back in the 80s and 90s, especially, you know, specifically around AIDS when I was doing a lot of AIDS reporting. And um, and we were the natural allies, right? We fought for those guys. I marched in their parades. I, I went to the rallies. I I did stories about the um, the homophobia around the way, you know, Tony Fauci was running the AIDS response. I did all that stuff. I did all that stuff. And now I'm called a turf, and they want to kill me if mm -hmm. I question the erasure. Right of women, right? And let me tell you this, Jennifer Lopez yeah. tried to put the women's symbol up during her sh halftime show at the Super Bowl and the British director of that show told her she couldn't do it because it was too exclusive, right? It was too exclusive. <laughs> uh, you cannot even do or say things about women. You can't, there's Tampax aren't for women. They're for right people we can't breastfeed we're chest feed. i mean all of this stuff do they not think that this stuff upsets us that we're being eroded out of the language out of reality this is misogyny it's misogyny i'm sorry it's sure it's misogyny, it is misogyny, on, misogyny steroids. on steroids and and yeah. everybody thinks it's just fine right yeah. they think it's just fine well this i don't is, get this it this is the propaganda that's been running you know 24 7 for at least seven years I mean, since Laverne Cox was on the cover of Time magazine, it has been relentless. Yeah. And when are we ever away from our tech? It's everywhere. Yeah. You go to the, you go to a, you know, a, a restaurant to have something to eat. There's a TV in there, right? There's the internet is there. You know, you go to a library, it's the internet. You know, you got your phone with you 24 seven. You know, in New York City, there's there's little uh, TVs and the taxi cabs. So you're never divorced from this message that is going, 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 going. And this message is being put out by media conglomerates that are that are uh, fused to the medical industrial complex and big finance, big banking. Um, it, it, you know, people think they're looking at an article on Slate magazine or or Vice or Vanity Fair or you know these are conglomerates. These are part of conglomerates that are sending a message, a consistent message. I actually wrote a blog post about this. Um, you know, Sports Illustrated has had like four men on the cover of their magazine now in little bikinis, you know, posing as women. Oh, I can't. I said, yeah. Four. And also and also a massively overweight woman as well. And it's supposed to be a sports magazine about health. Right. But we can't right. talk about that either. Uh, right. Is, right? <laughs> but but just but, but I, I just want to go back because you're one of the few people. I know of who's actually pondered this idea that, you know, sort of beyond our exposure to the internet. But what is it in us as a culture and a society right now that we are accepting absurdity after absurdity after absurdity and even feeling we need to support it and codify it and vote for it? What has gone wrong in what that uh, person called weird culture, the one I talked about earlier, Western culture, Western rich culture, essentially, 
that we are accepting this as if it's inevitable and supportable. What is it? Well, I mean, I hate to keep harping on the same thing, but I really think that it's an intersection of uh, capitalism, uh, late stage capitalism, corporatism, and technology. I mean, technology is so much uh, more advanced than any of us really give consideration to. It's happening to us gradually, our, uh, our melding with tech. Uh, so we don't realize it's happening. But but Jennifer, um, let me just ask you this. Why are we stowing our own, first of all, our own reality, but also our own belief system? You know, anybody who says that drag queens are not sexualizing children, drag shows, as you well know, I used to go to them back in the day and love them. It was a late night activity. You went at, you know, after the bars closed, it was super fun. They were pretty talented. Most of them, at, you know, lip syncing songs and dressing up and it was great, but it was sexualized. It wasn't family entertainment, right? Right. So how, like, how did we get to the point where well, this is we don't I'm care about, about the child? We don't care about, we just, it's more about supporting that than protecting Children, it, it's, it's, I, I don't understand how we can do that. I just don't get it. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's propaganda. You know, it's first of all, it's propaganda. And second of all, it's, it's the fact that we've been so isolated and our communities have been so decimated by yes. technology and religion has just fallen apart. You know, people aren't as religious and religion is really taking a back seat to technology. So whatever our tech tells us, it's like we're right there with us, especially if it's progressive. I mean, the fact that this has been sewn to the LGB is just, it's really, I mean, politically, strategically, it's absolute genius. I mean, yeah. and I, I say that all the it time is. to myself. It's like, cause I'm looking at it all the time and I'm like researching it. And it's like, oh my God, this is genius. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, it really, really is. I mean, people have already been cultivated to accept, you know, same sex attraction. You know, it's fine. So now if you go out of bounds and say, but wait a minute, what is this thing? You're looked at as a bigot, as a horrible person. Let's just get back to this moment because I think you are on to something. And that is that, um, you know, this idea that we will sacrifice our children. Um, there was a kind of a kerfuffle. I guess it was mostly a Twitter based kerfuffle, but it was started by um, one of the one of the right of center uh, podcast hosts, I forgot who it was, but there was a story on Fox News, right? And the story was about a kid who transitioned from girl to boy. Uh, it's about the family, it was a really good looking American family, blonde and blue eyed and healthy and tanned and stuff. And it was on Fox News and it was about the transition of this, this kid. And the mother says in, this, in the show that the, the kid who was born a girl was indicating to her while she was still or while, while she was still nonverbal, nonverbal, that she wanted to be a boy, right? So under the age of five and that she knew from that, that this was, you know, real, Be I guess maybe the little girl didn't want to wear dresses, which of course I didn't either. I was sort of a tomboy. Um, and, 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 and off they went. And she said a couple of things that were the mom that scared me. One of them was she's, she used this phrase, I'd rather have a live boy than a dead girl. This cliche phrase that is beaten into the head of parents yep. who are told their child will commit suicide if they don't yep. put them in the, you know, in this path, on this path to transition and drugs and surgery, et cetera. Right. She was spouting that. And I thought, I, I don't mean to demean her by saying spouting, but it's a cliche. It's a it's a piece of propaganda. It's cult indoctrination. It's cult, yes, yes, yes. It's yes. cult indoctrination. People are indoctrinated. This this has been running 24 seven in all forms of media. And what I want to just clarify there, unless people think we're mean, is that some of the most of the children who appear at these gender clinics are deeply disturbed by something. And whether or not there is a suicide attempt involved in this, ascribing it instantly to a gender issue is doing that kid a great disservice, right? There's a million and one reasons why kids today might be suicidal. Part of it is that we've given them a, a terrible 
environment to grow up in. We're all divorced. They're addicted to their screens. We lock them down. We close their. We're school. telling them their 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 biological reality is not real. Yeah, I mean, there's a million and one reasons why our kids kids are bonkers, and and uh, I, I I do believe that there is social contagion, obviously through the internet. But I, yeah, I also just think our kids are more nuts than they used to be. We're seeing it. I mean, yeah, sure. Look at the two sure. shooters at you know at Uvalde in Buffalo. They were 18, right? So it it was Ben Shapiro who reacted to that Fox News story and didn't actually even think it should have been on Fox News, which I thought was was sort of interesting. But but for me, just getting back to what I did on satanic ritual abuse, the other similarity to the paradigm is that you cannot question it, right? The media can't question it. If you questioned somebody who was claiming to have been abused by a satanic cult where they murdered and ate babies and, and the kid witnessed it and my mom was involved, my whole, the whole town was involved, but I didn't remember it till I went to a shrink all, and then I got multiple personality. If you questioned that in any way, you were a bad person. And it was a right. woman named Debbie Nathan, God love her, who was writing about that way, way, way before capturing the Freedmans ever happened, right? And she was a very brave and smart person. And she was quite neutral about it, as was I. But when we did our two big documentaries about it, which were kind of seminal at the time, and we had a lot of explaining to do to our feminist sisters who said, well, you can't write stories that suggest that maybe sexual abuse didn't happen or that women didn't experience what they claimed to remember. Like we were, you know, criticized. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. So, but, but yeah. then here's what happened. And I wonder if this is going to happen with the trans extremism thing. And that is that courts, both civil and criminal, sorted it out. Right. The McMartin preschool case, they had to examine the evidence. There was none. Prosecutor quit. All kinds of uh, therapists who were inventing this stuff out of whole cloth through hypnotherapy with their patients mm -hmm. uh, were sued and lost. And eventually the insurance companies just said, we're not doing this anymore. So get a new life. And slowly it went quietly away. The DSM, whatever it was, was changed from having borderline or not borderline multiple personality disorder was changed to dissociative disorder which is broader and and much less specific but nobody ever really said hey media stop talking about this we were wrong and it's over right it just melted away in a series of lawsuits and I guess in this case, it is being driven by money and it may be ended by money when these kids grow up and hit 28 or 30 and say, man, I really don't want to be this. How did it happen? Right? I don't see that happening here. You don't? Why, um, what that? No, because, because, I mean, unless human consciousness has just an enormous, an enormous shift and their um, animal self-preservation actually kicks in. Um, and we start working together against this um, juggernaut. Otherwise, I don't really, I don't really see that happening because people are already so um, entrenched in their technology. Yeah, you know, most people couldn't support themselves in the woods. You know, if they didn't have a way out of the woods, you know, for a week, you know, yeah. they'd starve to death. Yeah. They're a human yeah. animal. They're an animal. They're part of nature. They couldn't support themselves. They wouldn't know what to eat. You know. Um, if you take their technology away, however, you know, well, how do they get to work? How do they do their work? How do they do anything? You know, I've lost my phone before. I mean, actually, you know, palpitations and like starting oh, to sweat. Okay? Anxiety. I know me too. Me yeah. Too. Oh yeah. This, yeah. this is real. We are already melded so much with our technology and they are taking us in this direction for this to happen more and more and more. You know, and um, this is what it's all about. I mean, I know it sounds absolutely crazy, but this is where the money goes. This, all the people like really funding this, like, you know, showering all the organizations with billions of dollars to drive this ideology are invested in tech and, and uh, pharma. The uh, two biggest um, LGB organizations used to be LGB organizations, um, uh, Arcus Foundation, uh, and um, Gill Foundation. Gill comes out of software and technology. Stryker comes out of uh, finances and he's uh, heir to a multi-billion dollar medical corporation, Stryker Medical. 
So, uh, you know, and they're, you know, drowning these organizations, these LGBT organizations that they have, these NGOs, and changing laws and changing minds. Yeah. You know, they've built an enormous political infrastructure to drive this. They're not going away anytime soon. They're not just going to, oh, a few lawsuits are going to, you know, send them back to hell where they came from. I don't think so. (laughs) <laughs> but what about what about like is has Biden passed his um, conversion therapy law? I know they're talking about it, and it's got the yeah, same. I don't know if he actually did it, um, yeah. or if it's still on the table, or what. Uh, and it has the same problem. It doesn't allow therapists to investigate childhood mental illness as something other than trans if gender is mentioned in the conversation, because then it becomes conversion therapy. I mean. Somebody and this is, you know, this has also been dropped on us really, really fast. Yeah. You know, like COVID. Yeah. I remember when COVID, you know, when I first got the the announcement that, you know, this, this you know, this virus was let loose and da-da-da-da-da. And, you know, I mean, I just felt like like the, the ground under me, like, you know, like something wasn't really stable here. You know, like I was really, I mean, I was almost traumatized. Like, this is like so crazy. And then all this conflicting information really shot at us really fast and over and over again and over and over again and over and over again. It's like, um, it's like a psyops, you know, yeah. like the same thing happened during 9-11, you know, this event happened. It was like the media was just, you know, sending all these messages to us, you know, over and over and over and over again. And the building's coming down, and the building's coming down, and the building's coming down. It's like, holy God, way to traumatize the public. Yeah, you know, and when you're traumatized, you can't act in your own self-defense. You usually stand still at the first sign of like if you hear gunshots, most people freeze. They don't immediately drop themselves to the ground unless you had some kind of training, you know, to this is how you react in this situation. If you if you're just a normal average person and you hear gunshots, you're like the first thing you do is freeze. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I think you're right. I mean, I guess the difference for me about COVID was I I was a medical reporter in a previous life, and I'd okay, had okay. Well, I'd had some ex- yeah. yeah, and I'd had some experience with Tony Fauci, and I knew he was getting he couldn't be making claims about what the um, what the death ratio was from COVID because he didn't have both parts of the fraction, you know. So I. I found, I, I actually knew who Johnny Anitas was from previously, and I found what he was saying based on the Diamond Princess data, and I, I knew immediately that this was not going to be a huge deal for most people, um, and that Neil Ferguson's numbers out of the UK were absurd, but and that was findable information, but, but the fact that Fauci was getting something wrong again was not, I, I was not shocked by that i i mm. did, that was my experience with him right so i just kind of hit the internet and researched what the smart people were saying and said yeah okay super stratified i'm in no danger and let's take care of the people in long-term care which is exactly kind of how it played out right but anyway so let's i, I just want to wrap up here with you and thank you so much for doing this um i've wanted to talk to you for so long um i i we're, we're talking about children and um, and the idea that they get kind of tracked into these, you know, on this path, whether it's the right path for them or not. Um, do you know how many of them end up actually having the surgery? I know I heard someone say the other day, you know, young women are getting their breasts amputated. And I just thought, oh, God, why are they letting that happen? But but they are. How the many? The last figure on GoFundMe before they... Um before that was quoted an awful lot and they shut it down, um, being able to see the statistics on how many are, are, are asking for funds um, was 40,000. 40,000 young women um, on GoFundMe, which is a oh. campaigning platform for money um, to have their breasts removed. Um, 40,000 of them were doing that. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't really have a record you know, but the uh, the surgeries themselves are going to run into the billions by 2026. I mean, that's market analysis. Um, and that's just, you know, the actual, you know, carving up of your genitalia. Um, you know, if that, that doesn't include like facial feminization surgeries or what they're going to have to do to your arm to, you know, to make it workable again after you have a phalloplasty. Because um, they, they, the right? yeah. yeah. they take the skin from there, right? They take the skin either from there or from your thigh or any of the complications. And again, a lot of the people that are investing in the uh, gender industry 
um, hormones and uh, clinics and blah, blah, blah. Um, Besos, you know, Disney, uh, Mark Benioff, you know, these are guys that are also investing in uh, big fertility, you know, uh, cryopreservation of your, uh, of your uh, sperm and your ovaries and um, et cetera, et cetera, surrogacy. Um, so, you know, they're, they're making an investment in their future, you know, in the future of these children who will not be able to have um, babies, children. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also read, maybe it was in your work or some, someone else, they're also now talking about doing uterus transplants into man. I mean, how? No, that's just complete and total insanity. I well, mean, this is what they're working towards, you know. I mean, this is why they're breaking the boundary as well, you know, because they want to transfer uh, reproduction to technology. Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's hospitals in Brazil, the, the most elite hospitals in Brazil are giving women hysterectomies that, you know, uh, not hysterectomies, I'm sorry, they're having cesarean sections, not like 90%, you know, and I think there's 60% of women are having, um, you know, hysterectomies, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's all tech. It's, you know, it's, it's moving us away from our, our bio roots and, you know, colonizing that with tech, you know, so moving everything over to sort of a new platform, not the biological platform, but the synthetic platform. A synthetic reality, if you will. Look, I, you know, I feel upset for women. I feel upset for children. I feel upset for the utter and total and complete capture of all of our institutions by this and how money is actually behind it, people. Like a lot of this stuff, big money and, and big, you know, big important families who control political parties who don't care about Trish, us. Trish, you're still yeah. human. I'm still well for the moment. You're anyway, still right? here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you, Jennifer, for doing this. I'm so was, grateful. Oh, it was such a pleasure. It's so great to talk to you after so long. I know. We'll do it again sometime soon. Keep I writing. So. Keep writing. I will. Okay. I will. I'm not going anywhere. Good. <laughs> Take good care. So uh, that's a pretty amazing hypothesis she has. She has the receipts. She writes about it at the 11th hour blog. You should go there. Like I say, I don't agree with everything she says, but why, sh you know, we don't have to agree with each other and everything, do we? Is that, well, we've moved past that, right? So the article in Tablet is the billionaire family pushing synthetic sex identities. And I applaud Tablet for running that because it's very, very controversial. And now I want to tell you a story. And I think it's a story that should worry us all. I have a friend who's a young female artist. I like her very much and she's huge, hugely talented, lovely person. She told me a story today. The story was this. She was walking past Ryerson University in downtown Toronto the other night on the way to meet some friends for a drink. And as she was walking down a crowded sidewalk, she was attacked by a man who first grabbed her by the arm and then grabbed her around the throat and held her that way. As she cried and screamed for help at the multitudes of passers-by, no one would stop, right? This is like the Kitty Genovese story for me. No one stopped. It went on and on and on. She couldn't believe it, that nobody would make eye contact with her. Nobody intervened uh, after quite a long time until finally a couple stopped. The man part of the couple uh, was able to disengage this guy from her neck. And when he did so, the wife or female partner of some sort began to lecture my friend about how she needs to make better choices in her love life. The guy who grabbed her, by the way, was not some homeless guy. He was like a normal looking male, right? So she automatically assumed that my friend had made some choice to date a violent person or something. And, you know, and she was crying. She was very upset. She could have used a little bit of consoling, completely traumatized. Instead of doing that, she got a lecture from, from, the, from the woman. I mean, ugh. So the people keep on walking, the guy leaves and keeps on 
uh, uh, walking, the guy comes back and then goes after some elderly lady by grabbing her umbrella and, and, and wreaking havoc. And again, nobody really does everything. So I have to wonder when she told me this story, and she agrees with this, this uh, hypothesis, that this is our post-COVID world, I believe, right? Both in the aggression of this guy and the many, many, many people who walked by her predicament without stopping to help and then finally stopped to help and gave her a lecture about her bad choice of boyfriend. It was a completely surreal experience. She was totally, it happened in front of a Loblaws store too. And she kept saying, I don't know why I didn't just run in there. And I said, why are you blaming yourself? It's not your fault that nobody came to your rescue here, right? But this is what women do. We get attacked and then we're like, why didn't I, you know, I mean, stop it, right? I was trying to help her, young, lovely young woman. But, you know, she, she said, and we discussed for a minute or two, the idea that our society has changed post-COVID. It has changed post-COVID. I'm flabbergasted that in, it used to be Toronto the good, the city I live in, that people would pass a young woman being grabbed by the throat on the street and, and crying. It's just, it's astonishing. So, you know, we got to think about this stuff. We got to think about who we have become at the end of this two years of trauma and hellishness. Because uh, we're better than letting a young woman struggle in the middle of the street. It is Kitty Genovese, except she died, I believe, if I remember correctly. Anyway, that's my story. Stay critical. See ya.